you are you ready to start, Ran? I hope nobody minds if we're starting six minutes early. This just means you get extra time for your coffee. Welcome back, Massimo. Good to see you again. Um, okay, so uh, our final speaker for the pre-break session is uh, guitar master and wonderful topologist Ran Levy. It is, uh, and he's going to tell us about applications of neighborhoods and directed graphs in the classification of binary dynamics, which I'm sure is the longest title by at least two words in this workshop. Take it away, Ran. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction, for the invitation to, uh, I want to say to be here, but I'm in my own office, in my own home office. So um, yeah, hopefully that's going to end at some point in life. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, the, the motivation for this project comes uh, from what I've been doing uh, in the last few years uh, from um, neuroscience and in particular, my obsession with neuroscience is not the actual neuroscience understanding the actual brain, but rather trying to understand what it is that it does. And, um, and in more specifically, when the brain gets a signal from outside or from the inside, doesn't really matter. Something happens there and how do you interpret what's happening? So in short, uh, like a short summary of this talk uh, is basically if you think about the, the brain as a network of neurons, uh, you can interpret it as a directed graph. I'm gonna talk in detail about on de in detail about that in a minute. Um, try to classify the spiking activity of its neurons. Uh, and that's what we call the binary dynamics. So that's, it's, the idea is very simple. The, the interpretation, as you'll see, is a, a little bit more involved. So let's uh, very briefly talk about uh, the, you know, the, the physicality of the brain. And we all know what the brain is. Uh, brains are made uh, of neurons. Here's a, a nice picture of a single neuron. Uh, there's a soma, there is a center of the neuron here, and then uh, it has uh, all these uh, little glowing bits on its uh, arms is uh, the synaptic connections that it is able to form. And um, a neuron ha would have uh, something between a few hundred and a few thousands uh, such connection. And given its size, it's pretty amazing. And what is even more amazing is that these synapses are in fact, these are very, very intricate, as you can see in this picture here, very intricate connections are chemical connections. They're not just like, you know, wires, they're chemical connections. And when uh, the neuron has enough potential, enough action potential in itself, then it, uh, it spikes and it transmits the energy into its synapses and the synapse will either respond or not respond. And that's fairly stochastic. You can't really predict what it's going to do. And sometimes you can if the, if the signal is strong enough, but generally speaking, um, uh, the behavior of synapses is very noisy. It's very kind of unreliable, if you wish. Still, we know because we know that uh, organisms with a brain usually are capable of performing fairly consistent acts. Uh, we know that there is some sort of um, consistency in this activity. And this is what we're trying to decipher. Within, within all this noise, how does the brain do what it does so well? Okay, so uh, neurons, uh, when you put them together, I mean, they're tiny, they're the two microns in size. I mean, the, the arms, the, the dendrites and the axons are a little longer, um, but they're very small objects. Uh, they, they form together something that looks like, uh, you know, if you just take a few of them, like in this picture, something that looks like a root system of, uh, of a tree. Or the, or the foliage of a tree, if you wish. But in any case, they're very intricately connected to each other and they form um, a, a complex network of, uh, of uh, those objects, the neurons. Right, now, how do you encode activity, neural activity? That is very typical in neuroscience to uh, encode neural activity in terms of what is called a raster plot. So what we see here, and I'm gonna come back to this picture a little later, what we see here is an encoding of a signal going into a system of neurons, okay? Each one of the dots in, uh, in this picture here, each one of the dots, they're not very clear, but I hope you can see it. Each one of these dots means a spike that is inserted into a single neuron or a single fiber of neurons, okay? So you can see how, uh, you know, basically if you want to, if you want to encode uh, the neural, neural activity, you can just encode it in terms of these raster plots. 
Um, and similarly, you can do the same for the response of the system. So here is a raster plot, raster plot of, respon of neural response to a certain stimulus. I just picked this uh, picture from, from uh, you know, from online. I mean, there are lots of them, plenty of them. And what is, uh, what is important to know about this is that again, every dot, every dot here corresponds to a spike of a single neuron. The neurons are encoded as the horizontal lines in these plots. Uh, there are no lines, of course. On, a hori on an imaginary horizontal line, if you think about, uh, if you look at all the dots on that particular horizontal line, you, it means that the neurons at this point in time spiked exactly once, okay? Um, important to remember that this is completely insensitive to any ordering of the neurons. Okay, so uh, I can shuffle the, the rows in these pictures, getting a rather different picture, and it corresponds to exactly the same, um, the same activity. So pictures like raster plots can tell me how they can tell you how much activity there is, but it's very difficult to decode the activities to kind of decipher what the brain is actually doing, even if you have uh, full uh, information about uh, the spiking activity. Okay, it made me think uh, uh, while, I, while I was preparing this, made me think that this sort of presentation is sort of sigma n invariant. While the, um, uh, if you think about the, the rows as, I mean, n is the, the, the number of rows, the number of neurons you're looking at. It doesn't really matter which order you are, you are uh, presenting the information in. So in order to be able to do something with, uh, with um, uh, this subject, you need to have uh, a lot of information coming from a brain. Um, so, and by a brain, I mean in a very kind of uh, wide context. What we have in our at our disposal is um, one of the blue brain reconstructions of uh, uh, brain tissue. Uh, in this particular case, this picture is um, um, a system which consists of. Um, uh, roughly three, three, 31,000 uh, biologically accurate neuron reconstructed on a supercomputer that form uh, altogether uh, roughly 8 million connections um, between them, synaptic connections. Uh, we did some work, which I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, soon, but the, from the point of view of this talk, the most important bit is that we can simulate activity on this, uh, on this system and actually read off everything that every, each and every one of the neurons in the system does, okay? So this is, this is the attraction for, from the point of view of this project, this is the attraction of working with a system like that. And also bear in mind, it is as biologically accurate as any artificial system that uh, was so far built uh, can get. Okay, so. Uh, let's do some, so, so how do we think about this? So since we have all this the information about the, the neurons and their connections uh, and their form, they form connections in a directed manner, then it makes sense to think about the neuronal, net, neuronal network as a directed graph, okay? Uh, the vertices will be, uh, uh, generally neuroscience will be any sort of unit. So it could be brain regions, clusters of neurons, individual neurons. In our case, it will be individual neurons and uh, edges will be directed or undirected connections between them, depending on the context. So a directed graph. And uh, on directed graphs, um, what you wanna do basically is you want to take this spiking information and you wanna put it on the directed graph and then get uh, decipher that information in a way that takes into account the edges and the direction, not only the fact that you have you know, 31,000 neurons or even 5,000 neurons. I want to also take into account the way in which they are connected to each other. So we define for that matter, we define a binary state on a digraph to be just an assignment of binary values to its vertices. Okay, like, in, like you see in the picture, the same, the same graph as before, just I put arbitrarily zeros and ones uh, in, the, in the nodes and of course, zero means that at some point in that particular, uh, in, in this particular state, that particular node was not active, and one is uh, means that it was active, or the other way around, and depending depending on how you how you define things. And then what we call a binary, what we refer to as a binary dynamics, 
on a die graph is a sort of one parameter family, if you wish, of binary states, or to be uh, more practical, really, it is really uh, just a time series of binary states. Okay, it's not really, it's not continuous because obviously you're not working with uh, continuous functions here, uh, but so it's a time series of binary states. Okay, so here's the problem. Uh, here's a way of, of uh, defining a problem. So suppose we are presented with a large family of binary dynamics. So um, let's call it D. Okay, on some fixed large digraph. Typically, what we will be working with is uh, the digraph we are going to be working with is a certain layer of the of the reconstruction, so a particularly active, particularly important, particularly important layer of the digraph, uh, which consists of about four thousand five hundred neurons, something like that. Suppose then that we are given a collection of labels. This could be very, very, very simple. So the labels could be. Um, you know, some numbers from one to n, okay? And a function, suppose you have a function from the binary, from the set of binary dynamics into that set of labels. So basically you're, you're, every, every uh, binary dynamic function has some label, okay? We assume that uh, for each label, the inverse image in D carry some resemblance. So they're not the same, but they carry some resemblance. So for instance, they result from the same stimulus to a neural network, right? So we have, basically we have, uh, you know, maybe uh, five different uh, uh, stimuli and we insert them into the, into the network and we extract the responses. Uh, but then number four, the assumption, the fourth assumption is, we are assuming as you would in when you work with neuroscience that the collection of those responses is noisy. So, so the response to the same stimulus is not necessarily the same, but you assume that there is some resemblance and that's exactly what you want to classify. So the aim is to find an efficient method or efficient methods that will turn binary dynamics um, on D into something that you can send into machine learning and then try to classify. Okay, so that's basically what the project is about. All right, so let's look at some uh, let's look at some uh, familiar concepts. So what we want to do basically, we are topologists, so we want to take uh, at least most of us are, uh, and um, we want to take the brain and make it a topological space by somewhere somewhere or another. Then uh, take the take the topological space that that we constructed and extract information from it. So let's have a look at some familiar concepts. Why is this not working? For some reason, this is it, okay. Right, so some familiar concept. How do you turn a graph into a topological space? If you look at the literature in combinatorial topology, there are like all garden, all zoo of objects that you can associate with, um, uh, with a graph or a digraph. Uh, and the result will be a topological space of some sort. So in the neighborhood complex, for example, you have the flag complex or the dual independence complex. You have the, the category of that, uh, I mean, a digraph generates uh, a category. So uh, you can take the nerve of that category or the category itself, if you wish. Uh, you can take the neighborhood community, the neighborhoods uh, or click communities. Uh, neighborhoods is important here because that's what I'm going to, that is basically the project I'm going to report uh, on primarily here. And then uh, there is the directed flag complex and uh, newer uh, concept, um, which we came up with called the flag turner plex. Um, and there are more, I mean, this is just to name a few. If you, there's, there's a book, um, there's a book by, uh, I forget the name, doesn't really matter, but um, Kozlov, Kozlov, uh, on communitarial topology and all those, all those construct, wonderful constructions are there in great detail with, up, with some applications. And these constructions typically would give you, you know, the familiar abstract simplicial complexes, which I'm sure I don't have to spend any time describing. Then ordered simplicial complexes, it's like, it's like, like abstract simplicial complexes, except now we are looking at a collection of finite ordered sets and they disclose under subsets. And you can also construct um, a semi-simplicial set. So, uh, you know, basically uh, something like a uh, uh, simplicial complex, except uh, now you don't have to, uh, um, uh, a simplex is not determined by its vertices or, or even its ordered vertices, but uh, the same similar rules apply. And, uh, okay, so 
here's the simplest example, at least the simplest example in, di in a directed in a directed sense of uh, construction like that. That's the directed flood complex, which we, uh, when, when we started working with, uh, with Blue Brain and with neuroscience in general, this was the first construction that we, uh, that we uh, looked at. So basically you, you have a directed graph and you are constructing uh, a complex out of its directed clicks. The directed click is um, a click where the, the edges are directed and such that the direction, the directionality of the, of the edges gives you a linear order on the vertices, okay? And so if you construct this, that space out of, uh, out of your digraph where the directed clicks are the simplest, of course it's closed under taking faces, then you get a topological space. Um, and uh, like you see in this picture here. And we use this, uh, we use this construction in this paper that is coded at the, at the bottom of the page. Another uh, wonderful construction that you can find in combinatoric, uh, combinatoric literature is uh, one of the N tournament. So a tournament is, a, again, a very simple object. Um, it's basically a, a graph, a digraph, where if you ignore directions, uh, it is just um, a complete graph. Okay, it's a finite digraph, which is complete if you ignore directionality, but you also put uh, arbitrary direction on each one of the edges, okay? So the picture here is, uh, well, it's so cool. I'm not gonna talk much about this. It's called a uh, regular nine tournaments, nine for the number of vertices, but as you can see, uh, every, every vertex is connected to all the others. So if you ignore direction, this is just an eight simplex, okay? Um, if you take a tournament, then by, by definition, if you take any subset of vertices and the subgraph it generates, it's a face. So um, if you look at it uh, from the point of view of a topology, so you immediately say, oh, but I can make a, uh, a, a well, a semi simplicial set out of this thing because it's closed under faces. And it's um, just uh, the natural thing to do from a topological point of view. Um, and how do you do this? Well, you just have to kind of introduce um, uh, if you have a collection, so we define the tournaplex to be a finite collection of tournaments that is clo closed undertaking faces. Um, and um, that's easy to define. You want to turn it into topological space, then uh, you have to give it a structure of a semi-simplicial set. And that's uh, very easy to do. You have n simplices are your n plus one tournaments. And to define the face operators, you fix a total order on the set of all vertices which induces a total order on the vertices of each tournament. And now you define phase operations uh, in, the, in the usual way and geometric realization as you would do for any semi simplicial set. And that's a construction we use in a different paper that uh, just recently appeared in the Journal of um, Applied Computational Topology. Just I think in the, in the most recent issue of it. Now, what do you do with these things? So, in our earlier paper, we looked at the activity in uh, the blueprint reconstruction, that's the same circuit I was showing you before. And basically those same, uh, the same family of stimuli, as you see here, uh, which is basically three families of stimuli, um, three families that, that are families because they're the same, each one of these is the same stimulus except inserted in different ways, okay? We call them S5, 15, and 30. So this is five, this first three, 15 and 30. And then we inserted this, we devised a, a method of, of extracting subgraph, a sequence of subgraphs from the, uh, from the big uh, blue brain graph uh, corresponding to the, to the response activity. We computed Betty numbers. And then what you see here on the right is the Betty numbers, uh, Betty one uh, graphed against uh, Betty three. Uh, as a function of time, so that the you know the, there is a there's a path here going from here like that, and as you can see, each one of these um, of these families give you a different uh, a different picture. So this is kind of classification, except you have to be very careful when you say that. So first of all, uh, the, uh, the, these these uh, simulations are very very strong. They are very, not, they're very much not like lifelike, okay? So uh, you want to get like a, quite an aggressive reaction from the system. So you 
you know, you stimulate it very strongly. In uh, natural brain, real life, this doesn't really happen. The, the, the signals are much weaker. Secondly, uh, what we graph here, it, it, this would be a more, what you see the graphs here of Betty 1, Betty 3 are a more um, accurate um, presentation of what things actually look like. And as you can see, these are a little harder to distinguish than in, the, in this picture. So when you say that you actually get a response which separates the signals, you have to be very careful with this statement because it's not really accurate. It's, it's too easy a task and the separation is not perfect. It's there, but it's not perfect. In when we tried, in, oh, I forgot to say something. When you use tournaments, tournaments are not just simplices. You can use the fact that they are different in um, in um, in terms of the, the different digraphs uh, to define uh, various numerical invariants of them, which we refer to as directionality. And directionality allows you to define a uh, filtration on those thermoplexes. And you can use, with this filtration, you can use a uh, persistent homology because you get a filtered complex. So any filtered complex gives rise to a, to a um, um, uh, persistence diagram. And so we could use that. So in that sense that it's more powerful than just a direct flood complex. So we ran two experiments. In one of them, we use the persistent homology information to vectorize uh, those three families of stimuli that, that I showed you here, these three families, to vectorize it. And in the other, we use the Betty numbers, all the Betty numbers, not only one and three, the zero, one, two, three, and four, um, to uh, get, to get uh, basically something that uh, uh, machine learning can digest, okay? And so, and then we compare the results. And as you can see, when we use the turnoplexes with, uh, with uh, precision homology, you get an almost perfect separation of the three signals. While the same experiment with the same data, about 5,000 neurons, but now vectorized by Betty numbers, the, the uh, separation is rather pathetic, okay? So this shows that, that using tournaments is a much, it's well significantly more powerful than using just a directed flood complex, but still, these, um, these, this, the data here is rather simple and the task of separating it is again, not very challenging. We want more than that. So let's stop and think. First of all, it turns out that, you know, after playing with it for a few years, using the entire diagraph and its topology that, that works very well for simple tasks. The problem is that um, the problem is that uh, if you want to do something more complicated, then if you, using the entire network is just too large, as I just said, the signatures that you get from the signals are too similar to each other. You put something into an, uh, a system of neurons and many of the neurons spike. So it's basically like looking at the raster plot. It's a little bit more powerful than looking at the raster plot, but it's not a lot more powerful. On the other hand, Looking at single neurons, uh, again, it's the simplices here are too, or, are too small. Um, simplices or single neurons are like as a zero simplices, or even if you look at single simplices and what they do together, that's too small. The signature of the signals is usually too noisy. And the lower the dimension, the more noise there is. Okay. So the idea we came up with is basically try to use collections of subgraphs that could perform as computational subunits. One thing that you can say about neurons is they don't do social distancing. Um, they have to work together, okay? Neurons have to work together. And what, what message we are getting from working with, at least with this simulation of the, the simulation of the blue brain is that looking at how um, neurons operate together in the form of a, of a simplex, this is just, just not good enough. The unit is too small. So use collections of subgraphs that could perform as computational subunits almost independently, which will be larger than simplices, but much smaller than the entire circuit, okay? And I have two references here, it's just two recent papers still on archive, one in archive, one on bioarchive. And uh, the first one is one that I wrote with my group uh, in Aberdeen in collaboration with some people in, uh, in Blue Brain. The other one, uh, different set of, uh, of authors, 
uh, but that's on bioarchive and it's a lot more biological. So uh, if you want to see uh, what uh, what we did more precisely than what I'm going to tell you today, you can you can check them out. And let me describe what it's about. So here's the idea. So I'm not talking about uh, neighborhoods yet, but this is just a general idea. Suppose you have a way of selecting a collection of meaningful subgraphs of um, of the brain graph, of, of the entire graph, okay? Some meaningful sub, whatever that means. I don't know what it means yet, but suppose I have a way of selecting a collection of meaning, meaningful subgraphs. Let me suppose also that I'm given a binary dynamics on the digraph, on the full digraph, and I, would, I could consider then the induced dynamics on the collection that I chose. So now those coll that collection, each, each bit in it is going to encode part of the binary dynamics, okay? Now fix some algorithm, whatever, whatever algorithm you, uh, at this level, at this point of generality, at this level of generality, any algorithm that takes the binary state of a digraph and produces a subgraph of it, okay? So, um, you know, you get a binary dynamics on those, on those meaningful subgraphs. You take an algorithm that takes the dynamics and produces yet a smaller subgraph of that. And then fix a numerical, uh, or topological or graph invariant of digraphs and use it to vectorize, to produce a feature vector corresponding to that uh, binary dynamics. Okay, so uh, that is basically what I'm describing here is a very general um, way, a very, very, very vague as well. I'll, I'll be more specific in a minute. A uh, very general way of uh, trying to basically, instead of looking, I mean, you could take for your collection just a uh, say the top dimensional simplices. But first of all, there are too many of them. And second of all, it's again, gonna to be too small. So probably not very meaningful. I want something a little bigger. So it's a collection of meaningful subgraphs, um, find a way of inducing, of inducing dynamics on, uh, on, on, on those meaningful uh, subgraphs, produce subgraphs out of those, and then turn this into a vector by using some numerical uh, topological or graph invariant and produce a vector, fit it into, a, into some uh, machine learning algorithm and then train and test, okay? That's the general, the general picture. So here's what we had. Blue Brain gave us the following. So here is the, uh, what you see here is basically a family of eight, of eight stimuli, eight stimuli. Uh, which are different, okay? They're different uh, eight stimuli. Um, they come in um, uh, a random sequence, okay? Uh, about 500, 550, uh, something like that. Altogether, 4,495 4, repetitions of the experiment. Uh, eight stimuli, and each one of them repeated about 500 times, or a little more, um, in a random sequence. Okay, uh, of course we know the labels, but we don't necessarily want to use them. So what we want to do is, you know, train, devise an algorithm, train um, uh, some machine learning algorithm, and then test, predict the sequence. Okay, now I have to add that compared to what we did before, this, this, these, these eight stimuli are much more. They don't have any meaning, so it's not like the rat of which the brain is modeled after is thinking some particular thought. What it does mean is that, you know, if you look, if you just examine how a biological brain responds to a, a real stimulus, this is more, much more what it looks like than what it did before. So, and it's a very noisy, I mean, we checked it in various ways. It's a very noisy signal. So it's really difficult to say anything about it by any other means, okay? But that's the task. And so, the way in which we decided to choose meaningful um, um, subgraphs is to look at, uh, at neighborhoods. And why neighborhoods? Well, because the brain is an extremely highly connected uh, graph while being very sparse, okay? It's a very sparse graph, but it's very, very highly connected, okay? Um, so uh, typically, uh, you know, a neuron would have, you know, somewhere in the center of the column, 
will have anything between uh, a few hundred and sometimes even a few thousand neighbors. So neighborhoods could be huge. Um, but in any case, they'll be pretty large. I mean, at least 50 neurons in each neighborhood. What is a neighborhood? Well, basically just look at all the neighbors, all the immediate neighbors of the neuron and take the subgraph that they generate. Okay, this is the closed neighborhood. Okay, the open neighborhood is, is the whole thing. The same, the same picture in red here, but without the center. Okay, so, so that's what we call a neighborhood. And it makes a, makes a lot of sense to, to look at neighborhoods in a, in a brain graph be, exactly because it's so highly connected and a neighborhood is gonna be a substantial unit of neurons which are connected to each other, at least through um, the center. Um, and uh, well, with some likelihood can, can collaborate, can work together like a neighborhood, like a neighborhood with good neighbors. Problem is every vertex is the center of its own neighborhood. So if we have 31,000 neurons, we have 31,000 neighborhoods. So how do you choose neighborhoods which are meaningful? So again, you have the same problem. I mean, choosing all the neighborhoods is like choosing all the, all the, all the neurons. We don't wanna do that. So we wanna choose meaningful neighborhoods. So to do that, what you do is you look at um, what, you know, what the literature, literature uh, proposes um, as you know, graph invariance, topological invariance and also invent a few. So we looked at things like the clustering coefficient, I'm not giving you any detail about what these things are, just, just saying that these are typical um, uh, invariants that uh, one studies in, in graph theory, especially in applied graph theory. Clustering coefficient, we, we invented a, a new one to call transitive clustering coefficient, which is kind of more suitable for working with, uh, with um, uh, directed graphs as, as far as we are concerned. Then there are the classical spectral graph invariants like the Laplacian, uh, transition probability, and Jason spectral gaps, spectral radius. Um, we introduced a few others. Uh, called density coefficient is some, some way of, of, of measuring the density of, uh, of simplices in, uh, in a neighborhood or a normalized Betti coefficient, which is a norm, like a, it's like the, the Euler characteristic, except it's not an alternating sum and it's sort of an average of the Betti numbers of the neighborhood and many more. We, we altogether tested 32 different parameters um, that you can associate with, uh, with a die graph, okay? With any die graph, but in particular with, with the neighborhood. So remember, it's just a die graph after all. And, and then we, for each one of these parameters, these invariants is a numerical invariant. So it takes values in the real numbers, usually the positive real numbers, and you can um, uh, sort your, your vertices uh, from top to bottom. And we call the top ones champions, whatever, you know, whichever number of them you decide should be champions, not only three usually. And then you have the losers, you know, the ones that are at the bottom. Um, which again, to say losers is a bit, uh, you know, kind of, um, misleading because sometimes the losers are operating very well, but we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so now what do we do? So the preparation uh, takes a little bit of uh, effort. So basically for each vertex, you compute the closed neighborhood. For each one of the vertex, you, close, you compute the closed neighborhood and the directed flag, in the directed flag complex. You can do another topological invariant, but uh, topological construction, but that's, what, that's the one we took because this is the simplest. Take the directed flag complex and the closed neighborhood. You compute then the associated parameters for all the vertices, okay? Clustering coefficient, transitive clustering coefficient, all of them, okay? And then you sort out, you, you kind of isolate the top 50 and maybe the bottom 50 uh, and you know the champions and the losers. And uh, you look at the closed neighborhoods and, uh, um, and the, um, the flood complex, the flood complex of those closed neighborhoods. Now, this is this is so much for your preparation of your, you know, of, of your of your champions and your losers. Now you look at the data extraction. So you divide your stimulus interval into some sub intervals and, and isolate the the you know the meaningful bit because usually what happens when a signal comes in, there's a response and then it dies out. So see where the response is concentrated and divide this into some sub intervals where you can actually, you know test in, at various points how it behaves. Okay, so that's what you see here. All right, so um, now you start extracting the data. So you fix a sorting parameter P, 
right? So this is what determines. Solid parameter P is what determines the champions, okay? Or champions and losers. For each one of these stimuli, right? Each one of the stimuli and each one of the time bins, um, you then calculate those, the, the induced subgraphs. You look at all the neurons that fired in this time bin, and then you look at the subgraph generated by them within each of the neighborhoods, okay? And you compute for those, you compute for those, um, uh, the, the flag complexes, the, the, the subgraph, and the graph invariance. Okay, so for instance, if you look at this picture, then you have uh, you have uh, the uh, the neighborhood, which is the green and the red together. That's the neighborhood. The active part is the green part. You isolate that, and you compute whatever invariance uh, you uh, you can for it. Okay, whatever invariance you can for it with, from the same list from the same list, okay? So if you use the, this is the, 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 the list of parameters in two ways. You first of all, use them to sort, so you choose your 50, and then for each one of those 50 neighborhoods, you again uh, compute all those parameters, okay? So in the end, what you get is um, a pair of parameters, P and Q from the same list of 32, okay? And you can, produce a matrix which corresponds to time bins, um, neighborhoods, and pair of parameters. Okay, it's a little complicated, but uh, I mean to describe, but in the end of the day, uh, you know, once you kind of figure out how, you know, how to do it, it's, it's rather straightforward. So you have the, those, those parameters, P and Q, you, um, have your neighborhoods you compute you, that you chose according to P and you then compute according to Q. And then each one of those computations is gonna be one entry in this matrix, okay? In the end, in the end, what you get is a matrix, which I'm gonna denote by EKPQ. It's a feature vector, a feature matrix. And the, it corresponds, well, first of all, which mac microcircuit you used. We have, we used one of them, one of the 42 that were available to us. It depends on the, on the sorting parameter P, okay? It depends on the sorting parameter P. It also depends on the feature parameter Q, so the one that I computed for each neighborhood. It depends on the choice of time interval and the number of time bins I divided this time interval into. And of course, at the end, it depends on the stimulus that I inserted as case. So I have 4,495 of them. It depends on that as well, okay? So all this data is supposed to be encoded in this matrix. And now, once we have that, this is something that, uh, that uh, a machine learning algorithm, like support vector machine, which is what we use, can easily digest. Our vectors are about the size 100. Uh, so for that uh, size data set, it's okay. And we use 60% of data to, to train and the rest to validate, uh, to, uh, to test, sorry. Okay. Okay, so I now present the results to you. So here's what, uh, what we have. So basically what you see in these is uh, at the bottom on the x-axis, you have the, what the main parameters we use for selection, for sorting out the top 50, okay? Um, these are in the left is the champions and on the right is the losers. Okay, so these are the bottom 50 and these are the top 50. On the Y axis, you have the same parameters. You have the same parameters, but now um, they are used to uh, vectorize, to create the feature vectors. Okay, so each rubric here corresponds to selection parameter and feature parameter, and the number in the middle is uh, basically uh, the classification accuracy. And interestingly, we got uh, one of the, uh, um, the parameter that, that featureized the best was simply the size, how many, how many neurons uh, fired within a neighborhood, within each neighborhood. And with that, we, get, we managed to get 88% accuracy, which is pretty high given how noisy the, I mean, given that 12 and a half percent would be um, 
random, 88% is really nice. But notice that the, the, that, that particular feature parameter performs well with respect to almost everything, all the, all the selection parameters. And this is gonna come back uh, a little later. Another, another observation is that if you look at the losers, it's a very different picture. But still, the size, uh, Euler characteristic, and uh, normalized Betti coefficients perform quite well. You can also get, if you select by Euler characteristic and, um, and featureize by size again, again, you get 88%, okay? But Euler characteristic is tricky. It's, a, it's a, an invariant, which is a homotopy invariant, and also can get negative values. And, and so you're, it's really difficult to say, with Euler characteristic, big is not necessarily good. Okay, so, uh, but that's interesting just to observe, just as an observation. Okay, well, um, interesting, but let's see if I, you know, if it, if it stands any, uh, any validation. So we decided to, um, yeah, I'm just, this, this picture is just repeating the previous one on the left, except now I point out exactly uh, that the Chung Laplacian spectral radius is the best selection parameter and the size is the, the best um, featureization parameter. So right here, 88%. Okay, validation. How about choosing neighborhoods at random? Just choosing versus at random, looking at the neighborhoods and using exactly the same feature parameters as before. It turns out the, 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 the performance is not bad at all. The one difference that you see almost immediately is that the error, the error uh, bar is much larger when you should do things randomly. Whereas for instance here, uh, when you look at the um, uh, bauer laplacian spectral radius here uh, as a feature and uh, John laplacian spectral gap as, so this is feature, this is a uh, sorting, um, you get a small error bar and a larger, a small error bar and, and better accuracy. Even uh, here where random is doing almost as well as, um, as um, you know, the, the educated choice, still the error bar here is tiny and here it's much larger. But it's striking to see that random selection also performs fairly well. And I'm going, to, I'm going to get back to that uh, in a minute. Another test that we did, we did four or, four or five different tests to kind of validate our, our results is um, to basically shuffle the activity. So we shuffle the activity, as you can see here, these are the shuffle, the shuffle activities with respect to various feature parameters. And if you look at the top line here, this compares it to the, you know, the best activity we are able to get. And you see a dramatic, rather dramatic uh, reduction in performance. So um, I'm gonna spend the next uh, few minutes uh, on another, uh, another test. We decided to kind of get as far as possible from actual neural networks. I mean, still a neural network, but not really a, a biological neural network and see if we can do something with uh, something more artificial. So there is this, there is this um, software package called Nest, which offers a um, vast simplification of, uh, of neural networks. And we designed sim, you know, experiments that are similar to, um, to what we did in the biological system, uh, but this time um, it's, it's quite artificial. I mean, really there's nothing to do with biology, just to see how our methods work. And so this is what the signals that we inserted look like. These are eight different families again, and these are the results. As you can see, the performance of the red here is, is comparing it to the performance in, uh, in the blue brain system, but the performance is still pretty good. What is most interesting here is that um, we needed really a very small density uh, to get the best results. So high density, again, means more noise and then less accuracy in classification. The best, the best accuracy we got with very small density of 0.1%, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, every, every neuron connects to uh, 10 others roughly on average. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we're trying to learn what the brain is doing by analyzing spike, the spikes uh, the neurons produce. The phenomenal hypothesis is that structure and functions are linked. And another one is that topological and combinatorial structures capture graph properties and hence can be used to decipher brain signals. Uh, that's what we are basically trying to show, or trying to demonstrate here. 
And also um, another conclusion, which I think is rather important is the methods are not limited to neuroscience. Every, every time you have some binary dynamics, you can use, you can use these methods. And all that remained for me to do is to thank my collaborators. This the group on top here are, is my student, Pedro, and four postdocs. None of them is a postdoc of mine anymore. They all are in different jobs. And my collaborators from Blue Brain, uh, Michael Ryman, Catherine Hess, and Henry Markram, the boss of uh, Blue Brain Project. And thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ron. That was great. Um... As usual, if you have any questions for Ron, put a cue in the uh, chat or just unmute yourself and shoot. I think Wojciech has raised his hand, so that counts as a cue, as has Marian. So uh, Wojciech, why don't you go first and then Marian? Hello, Wojciech. All right, Ron, really nice talk. Uh, Ron, most of these, I mean, maybe I'm, uh, I'm wrong. So several of these examples that you were sort of extracting information, they were sort of local. Right or may, am I wrong? Like well, you look well, at local well, information well. about the network. Uh, uh, it yeah, it is local information about the network. Yeah. Right. So uh, so is there? Exactly. I mean, like I'm trying to understand. Like, is there a reason that like local information gives this you know rather strong classification? Yeah. Right? So yeah, uh, there is. There is. It's a good question. Thank you. So so the first thing we observed, we the first thing we did is we just used the classical clustering coefficient. And the first thing we observed is if you take, uh, I, don't know, I don't remember exactly, it's something like 500 neurons, 500 neurons and their neighborhoods sorted by the highest clustering coefficient, it covers 90% of the entire, circuit, the entire uh, system, the entire graph. Okay, okay. so because, because it's so highly connected, so efficiently connected, I'm not sure how to say it exactly, it's not highly connected, it's efficiently connected, um, you get that uh, that local information, in other words, the local neighborhood is actually all over the place. You we can also see that when we kind of graphed in the in the in the column, we graphed where the, where the neighborhood is. It's not local; it's all oh, over the place. Okay. Oh, I see. I see. So it's so they get information from everywhere. I see. Yeah. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. But just to com complement this this uh, this uh, question, uh, I mean, the other question is why certain parameters perform better than others, and for that we don't really have an answer. We we looked at spectral spectral parameters, for instance, because they are using data analysis, because they are using graph theory, because they are using so many other things, but we don't understand why those spectral gaps actually do the work they do, for instance. So that's something that we'll have to still uh, kind of try to figure out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Marian, did you have a question as well? I think I saw a hand. No, no, no. I just tried to clap my hands for the. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry. But anyway, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, maybe people are very eager for coffee, but let me ask one question, uh, Ron, about the, uh, the fact that both Euler characteristic and cardinality were sort of doing well. I mean, they, they happen to coincide in, in simple cases when you have a zero dimensional space. So I was wondering what fraction of your, you know, it's always possible that the link of uh, uh, there are no interesting directed cliques. Uh, in, in the link of one of your vertices, and therefore there's not much difference between counting Euler characteristic or counting the number of vertices. So yeah. how, how intensely connected are the neighbors of a given uh, neuron once you yank out that neuron from the network? So it depends, it depends very much, it depends very much on uh, what parameter you are using. So uh, we actually computed, or we had to compute the homology of all those neighborhoods. Uh, so think of every parameter and every neighborhood for an entire system. Uh, yeah. we, uh, and it really depends a lot on the neighbor. Sometimes if you, if you take out the, the um, center, you get a lot of connected components. Sometimes you don't. We did get homology. So the, the homology of the entire system goes up to dimension five and it stops. If you, if you look at the whole thing, it's yeah. five dimensional, homotopically speaking. Um, we got with certain uh, with certain parameters. We got four-dimensional homology. 
Um, now, okay. of course, once you once you put a stimulus in and only a few of the neurons spike, the situation is different. Okay, it could be a lot a lot different, which could explain why all the characteristic and um, and uh, just counting the numbers uh, is give similar results. I would be tempted to think though that there could be a different explanation as well because all the characteristic is keeps surprising us. And I think it keeps surprising everybody. <laughs> it's not, us, not just us. Uh, sure. So I don't know the exact, I can't explain it, but I, I would be tempted to think it's not just that, but, but maybe something else because there is some topology there. There's some serious topology there. No, so sorry, can I just make a comment and put Q? But it could be, right? It could be that the number of components overshadows the other dimension. You know what I mean? There could be like many, many components. Yeah. And then, you know, each component has some geometry, but this homology may be, uh, may be uh, not so important, right? And, yeah. and if yeah. you take Euler characteristic, then it will be not so much difference between. Yeah, but I want to show you something. I want to show you, I want to point out something in a, in a plot that I showed before, but I did not uh, spend any time on it. So if you look, um, where is that? Is it here? Uh, well, uh, just a second. If you look at, I think it was here. You look here, okay? So this, this selection parameter here is the, um, the normalized Betti coefficient, okay? okay. So the normalized Betti coefficient, I mean, if you, have, if you have a high normalized Betti coefficient, it means you have a lot of homology. Sure, sure, sure. Okay? And so, and this is actually in, in this in this experiment, this is the best parameter. Okay. Okay. So, so I think it's also I don't remember who did that. Maybe 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 you. I don't remember. Um, uh, you know, if you, you you want to, you definitely want to uh, uh, find the best parameters for the particular type of experiment you're doing. Okay, mm -hmm. so sometimes it could be that you know maybe with the with the blue brain, other characteristic and, uh, and and size are very similar because of what you said or because of some other reason. But I think in um, in this uh, you know in this other experiment, it wasn't quite the same. I mean, you can see you can by the comparison to you see where where the the results for the blue brain, the red, is rather low. The results here are rather high. Yeah, and the other way around. So you really want to, to make a good correlation between the, the, um, uh, the methods you're, I mean, not the method, but the selection parameters and the feature parameters that you're using and the particular type of, of, of data that you have. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Massimo, I cut in. <laughs> so. did, did you have a question, Massimo? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Um, it's about what you said before to uh, Wojtek, the fact that you have um, that the neighborhood of, of a single vertex could be um, very widespread, very much widespread inside the brain, meaning that, that you have uh, at a far distance your neighbors. Okay, this yeah. is very similar to what we uh, consider when uh, dealing with airports. Uh, by thinking of what could be uh, an important hub uh, is not just how many neighbors uh, you have, but if they are distributed in distance. I mean, yes. you might have quite a lot of, of, uh, of nearby airports, and this is meaningful, but not so much as having quite a lot close and quite a lot also far. I also think this, this is a dream of mine, that this could be important in uh, social networks for um, um, viral documents. You know, mm -hmm. it's not enough to have quite a lot of friends, but you must have also some faraway friends. And then this makes distribution of, uh, of documents um, worldwide. And, and so I think it might be also interesting for you to see what we have done in, in that area. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I, I'll take the freedom to send you uh, the Please, addresses yeah. of our. Uh, okay. Also, also the uh, uh, connectivity. Um, we also, as I said to uh, Wojtek before, uh, we have worked with uh, uh, blocks and uh, K blocks, and so higher connectivity. Okay, it might be of interest. Please have a look. Yeah. Just that. 
Absolutely, thank you. Great, uh, looks like there are no further questions. So thank you again, Ron. Um, thank you again, uh, all the speakers.